Okay, so uh, good afternoon and welcome to Montefiore Nyack Hospital Community Chats. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. And uh, my name is Denise Roma, and I am actually substituting for your usual host, Sandra Arvalo. And she will be back next week with you for the next chat. Uh, today, we're talking about treatment options for people living with inflammatory bowel disease. And this talk is in collaboration with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. And we are joined by Beth Javik and Lisa Harding, as well as Dr. Heller will be presenting for us today. And uh, with that, Lisa, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. I am going to just share my screen very quickly here, if you'll bear with me. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, I wanted to thank Sandra and Denise um, from Montefiore Nyack for um, inviting us to be here with you and share this presentation today. Of course, Dr. Heller, who will be presenting later on our treatment options. We thank you so much for your participation today. My name is Lisa Harding. I am the executive director for the Connecticut Westchester chapter of Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. So the chapter that serves all of our constituents here in Rockland County, Westchester County, the state of Connecticut, Putnam, Dutchess, and Orange counties as well. Um, welcome to all of our guests who are joining us from both near and far. We're very happy to have you. Um, at the end of today's presentation, we will be fielding questions from our guests. If you can please just enter your questions in the chat, we will be sure to get to as many of those as possible. So our goals for today to provide some basic information about inflammatory bowel disease, to introduce you to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and our local chapter, um, Dr. Heller will be providing an expert presentation on treatment options for IBD. And as I mentioned, we will end with question and answer. Um, so while today's presentation is meant to be informative, please note that I am not a healthcare practitioner, of course, Dr. Heller is, um, but certainly this is meant to just be informative, um, and please be sure to connect with your own healthcare providers and teams before making any decisions about your care. I'm going to start today with just a brief overview of inflammatory bowel disease. I'm sure some of you or many of you are very familiar with this. Um, so Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, as we know, are lifelong inflammatory conditions. They are autoimmune diseases that affect your gastrointestinal tract. These can be very debilitating diseases, highly misunderstood. Many of our patients require hospitalizations or surgeries. We estimate that there's about 70,000 new cases that are diagnosed annually. Um, and at the moment, there are no cures for these diseases. Um, so we want to work very hard as a foundation and as a, an IBD community to help positively impact the lives of patients and ultimately find cures for these diseases. We believe that one in 100 Americans, so roughly around 3 million Americans, is living with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, which together are known as inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. So what causes IBD? No one really knows exactly what the causes are of IBD, which is often what makes treating IBD more challenging. Um, we know that there are several factors that play a role, such as someone's genetic predisposition, environmental factors or triggers, things like your diet, the use of antibiotics, uh, exposure to a virus that could um, impact someone's um, someone developing these diseases. We also know that you know your microbiome is made up of millions of bacteria, fungi, and viruses that inhabit our human gut. And oftentimes those are a key link between the, gen the genetic portion and the onset of IBD. And then of course your immune response. Typically these factors all in combination can prompt the immune system to turn on, to have a reaction, and then sometimes it doesn't turn off, leading to an overactive immune system or the development of an autoimmune disease such as IBD. So each patient with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis has a very different disease course. 
um, a comprehensive treatment plan should be customized for each patient. That plan can include a number of different things, prescription medications, over-the-counter medications, surgery, sometimes alternative therapies. It's really important to realize that what works for one patient may not work for the other. Um, Dr. Heller is going to share much more about this later on in the presentation. So our mission here at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation is to improve the quality of life for children and adults that are affected by these diseases. We focus on research, we focus on patient support and education, professional education for our healthcare providers, as well as advocacy. Since our inception, we have invested over $446 million in research um, into cures and into better treatments. In 2021 alone, we funded $32 million um, in research, and that was about 200 studies. We pioneer groundbreaking research here at the foundation. We fund researchers all across the globe um, studying a variety of different um, topics related to IBD. And we have been part of every major scientific breakthrough in IBD, including the discovery of the first gene that was associated with Crohn's disease. We want to ensure that all of our IBD patients have access to care and resources, and our website, as well as our local chapters, have a wealth of information to share in terms of helping to expand your education, understanding your options, and helping you deal with all of the issues related to your IBD, not just the medical side, but your mental health and your well-being, working with your providers, et cetera. We have a number of support groups that are offered around the country. Some are virtual, some are in line. We have a peer-to-peer -peer mentor program called the Power of Two. We have an online support community. We also have a number of different education resources on our website, um, including recordings and opportunities to join webinars like this. And we also have our IBD Help Center, which I'll share a bit more about. Camp Oasis is a wonderful program for children living with IBD. Um, it is a summer camp for, for any child under the age of 18 who has IBD. We have roughly 12 locations around the country and it's such a wonderful way for these children to meet other kids with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and to give them a really um, enriching experience and help them find a community of other patients. Our national public awareness campaign is really designed to increase awareness for these diseases. As we know, many people are not so familiar with what Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are. Um, you can see these ads airing on over 140 TV stations. We have a clinical trials community, which um, helps our patients learn about cl clinical trials, understanding the process, as well as where these trials, trials take place. Um, you can get information from researchers and you can engage with other patients and caregivers who are willing to share their stories and experience participating in clinical trials. We have over 50 members of the Crohn's and Colitis con uh, Caucus and advocacy is a very important part of what we do for our patients and step therapy in particular has been an area of focus for us over the last two years. And right now, 31 states have now passed legislation around step therapy. And finally, this is some information about our IBD Help Center. We have trained specialists who are there to help patients free of charge, um, providing information and resources Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So please feel free to reach out if you have questions, if you need referrals, if you need additional information. Getting involved, we have 35 chapters around the country, as I mentioned, including the chapter that I work with here in the Connecticut Westchester region. We have events like our Spin for Crohn's and Colitis event, which is a stationary bike event. We have Take Steps, which is our largest um, event around the country each year. We have over 100 Take Steps events that take place. We have our Team Challenge events, which is an endurance training event. And then we have many different special events that you can get involved in in your local areas. Here in Connecticut, Westchester, 
we have a golf outing, we have a gala, and we also um, have a family friendly festival type of event that we host in Connecticut. And these are great ways to not only support the foundation, but to truly find and surround yourself with other patients and families who are living um, with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. We have local support groups right here in our area. I've listed a couple. All of these can be found on our website. Um, we also have a local board of directors, which is a wonderful group of volunteers who come together, who help lead the chapter and the activities that we do for our patients. And we, in addition to our advocacy efforts, we have um, an action center on our website where you can sign up for alerts. And there's many different ways that you can help impact policy um, and lawmaking that's happening that will affect directly affect patients with chronic disease and potentially IBD. All of this information can be found online at Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org. You are welcome to reach out to me directly. I am always happy to hear from our constituents. And again, I thank you for your time. It is now my very distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Elliot Heller from the Digestive Disease Associates of Rockland, who's going to provide for us a great information about treatment options with IBD. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining this Zoom. Um, I just wanna thank uh, Dr. Adam Ehrlich for uh, sharing his slide set with me so that this presentation goes nice and smoothly since one of my uh, problems as a senior citizen is uh, tech getting my name on on where my photo my video is even is is not easy for me at this point in any event um, so um, I just uh, came back last night from a three-day meeting which I attend every year called Advances in Inflammatory Bowel Disease. And I'm happy to report that <clears throat> there are advances being made on a regular basis, both in um, uh, medications, but also more of our understanding of these diseases, uh, which will help down the road to lead to the Holy Grail, which is a cure. Um, First of all, I wanted to thank Lisa for reaching out for me to me for uh, offering me to uh, help with this. Um, in my uh, previous life, a few years ago, I was chairman of the medical advisory committee uh, of the chapter, and uh, I've also served on the board of trustees of the trap chapter, and I'm now an emer emeritus trustee. Um, so, in looking at what's available for treating uh, Crohn's and colitis. We have a host of medications now. There's now um, a lot of literature to support uh, diet therapy, uh, especially in younger people with Crohn's disease. Um, and of course, there's um, surgical uh, intervention, which at times is important not to forget in this era where we have all these new advanced therapies um, with biologic agents and small molecule agents. And sometimes we lose sight of the fact that the surgical option is often the best option for some people without the need for getting involved in long drawn out attempts at making their disease better, which might ultimately fail anyway and lead to surgery that's uh, gonna happen in a not as good uh, overall clinical physical state as would have occurred if it uh, were considered early on. Um, so looking at the medications, uh, the next slide. <clears throat> um, well, what are the goals of treatment first? Obviously for me, it's having a patient call me or come back for a follow-up visit and tell me they feel great, they have no symptoms any longer, um, and I look inside their colon or get into their small intestine when I do a colonoscopy and see that everything has healed up. And for me, that's, that's terrific. And it's a sign that the medications I've been prescribing have been working and that the patient is feeling well. On the other hand, uh, the patient has uh, <clears throat> a different uh, set of goals. And sometimes we as physicians in our crazy busy days don't uh, really focus on some of the important needs of our patients. Um, and uh, 
looking at this list of going to prom, being successful at work, that is being able to work and not being disabled from these horrible illnesses in some cases, um, <clears throat> having um, an intimate relationship. It's often very difficult when a young person um, with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis ends up with an ostomy or um, a Crohn's disease patient has fistulae uh, and it really in impacts on their having int intimacy. Um, and also giving birth is, is sometimes a very difficult um, first conceiving and then carrying the baby and then giving birth it, all in the face of having this chronic illness. Um, and then just being able to participate in your family's important events, not just soccer games, but family gatherings, Thanksgiving, all the holidays. And all, obviously we wanna prevent cancer uh, in any way possible uh, by being very attentive to not losing sight of making sure that patients have adequate screening done. Um, so I want you to think about this um, slide very carefully because when I started in practice in 1977, the only things available were steroids, immunomodulators, and sulfasalazine. There were no sulfasalazine enemas unless you got a pharmacy to make it for you. There were no suppositories. <clears throat> there were a lot of side effects to sulfasalazine because of the sulfur part of it. People got headaches and digestion, couldn't tolerate it, they became nauseated. So basically it's steroids and immunomodulators and immunomodulators were just proven to be useful um, that year in 1977. One of my mentors, Dr. Daniel Present, who was actually very active early on in the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, um, did a study with Burton Carlitz, who just passed away within the last year or so, um, showing that uh, six per capita purine um, could basically uh, lower the need for steroid therapy in patients with uh, longstanding first Crohn's disease and then ulcerative colitis. Um, but now we're blessed with so many different classes of advanced therapy, starting with the uh, TNF inhibitors, including infliximab, adalimumab, golimumab, uh, cetuximab. So the, that was the first anti-TNF was approved in 1998 or 99. So we've been blessed with, with that, those therapies for uh, 24 uh, years. Um, and I can tell you for, for certain that the number of people that I've cared for who've, who would normally have been hospitalized uh, have not had to go to the hospital. It's made a huge difference in, in their well being and in avoiding surgeries. Um, and, and just being well, uh, and it's just, it's a these are miraculous drugs. Uh, following that, uh, we have, uh, gotten anti-integrins, which basically, <clears throat> um, are agents that prevent the cells, uh, that are active in the inflammatory process from getting to the intestine and causing the problem. Uh, most recently, we have um, <clears throat> IL-1223s, or now specifically IL-23. IL stands for interleukin. And these are, um, the, the interleukins are cytokines, which are chemicals that uh, lymphocytes produce that um, set off the inflammatory cascade. And so when they are blocked, the inflammation is halted or decreased markedly and healing of the bowel lining can take place. Um, Azanamed, uh, Azanamod um, has recently been approved for treatment of ulcerative colitis. That's in a different class and it's um, called an S1P uh, and there'll be another one along shortly. But these um, also <clears throat> help trap the lymphocytes that are active in the inflammatory process 
um, from getting out near the intestinal wall and causing inflammation. And uh, most recently, JAK inhibitors um, have uh, been utilized in ulcerative colitis. Um, and uh, a JAK stands for Janus kinase. And they inhibit uh, part of the inflammatory process as well. You, one, of the, one of the nice things for us as, as gastroenterologists is a lot of these medications were first used in rheumatology before they were approved in GI. So as a result, we have a great deal of confidence in their safety going forward <clears throat> based on the data that uh, has been seen with their rheumatologic use, whether for rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, psoriasis, eczema. And I'm sure you've all seen lots of commercials on TV for the same drugs for different uh, diseases. Most of these uh, medications, as you can see on both sides of this list, <clears throat> are used in both diseases, though not yet FDA approved uh, there will be JAK inhibitor use uh, in the not distant future for Crohn's disease. Um, and uh, there is overlap with the anti integrins, with the TNFs, and uh, the IL 1223s, though again, the insurance companies are not going to pay so easily for them in ulcerative colitis because they're approved for use in, in Crohn's disease. The next slide. So the, the uh, important thing is that all of these medications work. None of them work 100%. None of them work in, in all patients all of the time. And we have to choose very carefully on how to choose the medications <clears throat> based on the severity of the disease. Uh, and looking forward, based on the severity of disease, a presentation um, as what the patient can expect going forward to happen with their illness. So there was one, one trial um, called the Varsity trial that was reported about three years ago now um, that showed that vitalizumab uh, was better than uh, adalimumab uh, in, in treating um, ulcerative colitis. Um, there was another study called Seaview um, which showed that adalimumab and um, ustekinumab were uh, similar in, in results in bio-naive patients. That means those not previously treated with advanced therapies. So we used to talk about advanced therapies only as biologics, but nowadays there are other agents like the JAK inhibitors the S1Ps that are small molecules and not biologic in their form in their manufacturing process. Um, there have been no um, comparing, comparative studies in other medications as yet, but they're starting uh, to occur. Um, it also should be noted that there are new IL-23s um, in, in phase three studies. Um, and again, <clears throat> these medications have been used already to treat uh, some rheumatologic disorders. Um, the next slide, please. So as I said, we pick based, next slide, based on um, the IBD history, age of the patient, safety, efficacy, modes of transmission, um, other medical problems that might exist, and whether the patient has what are called EIMs or extra intestinal manifestations like skin diseases, like psoriasis even. Um, and ironically, anti-TNFs, though they are used to treat psoriasis can also cause it as an adverse uh, effect. Um, and of course, the bottom line is um, access uh, to payment for the medications. Next. Um, So again, um, no medication works for everyone. The, the best of the best in trials, there, there are several different um, 
markers that are used is clinical remission, endoscopic remission, endoscopic healing. And now we use a lot of imaging, especially in those with Crohn's disease. Um, and we have um, inflammatory markers that we can measure both in the blood and stool. The blood marker is C-reactive protein. The fecal marker is fecal calprotectin. And that's a good way to follow people without them having to undergo uh, as frequent uh, colonoscopic evaluations. Um, so the important thing is, and that we've learned over the past 10 or 15 years, is that starting early uh, is, is usually much more efficacious, especially for the younger age population, both pediatric and um, patients under the age of 30 in, in uh, the face of Crohn's disease and under the age of 40 um, in ulcerative colitis, that, that's considered a higher risk factor. Um, so what we're aiming for, obviously, is deep remission, understanding that we're not achieving a cure, but we're achieving something as close to a cure as possible. Um, we want to see these markers that I just mentioned go down in, in their um, values over a period of time. It's not instant, but some of them go down. The CRP sometimes goes down very rapidly um, when, when treatment is started with some of these agents. We want to minimize debility or disability so patients can carry on their daily life's functions, go to work, go to school, go to parties, and celebrate everything with family. Um, we want to try and avoid surgery when we can, but obviously when someone needs surgery, not to bury our heads in the sand and say that that's, that's a failure. In some cases, it saves a patient's life. Um, and allows them to move forward after that with a much better life uh, because we've removed um, a problem that's causing them great debility. Um, our therapies obviously have evolved and the, the medications are safe, though you always you know, hear and see these risks uh, such as the risk of lymphoma with um, a combination of immunomodulator therapy and TNFs. Um, and Corey Siegel, who's um, actually uh, grew up in Rockland County, um, mm -hmm. and he's the uh, head of the IBD Center at Dartmouth uh, College, um, or Dartmouth University now, I think it's called. Um, he, he has this great diagram where he has uh, stick figures on this large page and each one represents, uh, I think about a hundred people. And there's a little square box in the upper corner, which represents the likelihood of getting lymphoma after, you know, and this page is filled with these stick figures. So it's like one in a hundred thousand patient years. So it, it's really, though the risk is real, it's not, going to make you better if you don't take the medication. The, the worst thing to do is to avoid medication because of fear of um, side effects. The risks of the medications we know about, and we're very attuned to taking care of if, God forbid, there is a problem. Then there are the things like infusion reactions if someone's getting an infusion or skin site injection reactions for sub-Q injections. And there are allergic reactions just like that can be from any medication. Um, the risk of infection in long-term studies though is real, has not been that problematic because we know what to look for and what to expect. We can tell patients that they really have to be attuned to their body and let us know if they develop any kind of infection or even a fever so that we can uh, address it immediately. Um, cancer risks exist for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Uh, the inflammation apparently uh, can set off the process where which uh, neoplastic transformation uh, can occur. I remember back when I was in medical school 
at Mount Sinai. Uh, a paper was published in the New England Journal talking about the increased risk of colon cancer in patients with ulcerative colitis after having the disease for seven or eight years. And that's why we started uh, doing surveillance colonoscopies uh, to follow patients and test them for what's called dysplasia, which is a precursor of cancer. Um, and at that time, if someone had dysplasia, a colectomy or removal of the colon was recommended. Nowadays, that is not the case. And um, we're, we're much more, because of improvements in technology and our uh, colonoscopic techniques and abilities with narrow band imaging are able to pick up uh, minute foci of, of, of dysplasia and have that section of the bowel removed uh, rather than necessarily the entire colon, except in certain cases. Um, it's also been found subsequently that Crohn's disease patients, especially those with Crohn's colitis, can have a higher risk of getting cancer down the road. With TNFs, we worry about um, patients who have chronic congestive heart failure. Um, there's a warning uh, listed in the, in the package insert about not using them um, uh, for those patients. And now we have other choices that don't carry the same risks. Uh, with JAK inhibitors, there's a black box warning about increased cardiovascular risks. And this um, was primarily promulgated because of the older age population in the rheumatoid arthritis uh, sector who uh, were being treated with a uh, JAK inhibitor. Um, and there was an increased cardiovascular risk and has not been, to, been found to be in the same uh, category as rheumatoid arthritis patients, perhaps because of the age distribution of the IBD patients. Um, pregnancy and lactation um, are uh, special populations and um, one of uh, the uh, leading um, investigators in the field of women's health in IBD has been uh, a, a physician at University of California, San Francisco named Uma Mata Haven, um, who has published extensively on the use of advanced therapies in pregnant women. And um, except for the JAK inhibitors um, and um, the, there does not seem to be a problem. There are guidelines in terms of when to hold therapy toward the end of pregnancy. But the important thing is that a patient who's doing well will carry a normal pregnancy and not have problems. Uh, there are some important issues for lactation for some of the medications and um, for vaccinating the infant. Um, obviously, elderly people uh, have a higher likelihood, just like we've seen with COVID-19 infections, of having inf uh, infectious complications uh, lead to more difficult problems. And we're very attuned uh, to that possibly occurring. I must say that we have not had, thank God, any major, major problems with our older patients who are on advanced therapies. Um, unfortunately, now that I'm 75 years old, I'm in that elderly population. But even younger than that is 65 year olds are considered elderly um, in research studies. And they've had no real major uh, problems with uh, most of these therapies if they don't have other underlying issues. Um, immunocompromised patients so, such as those who've received um, solid organ transplants and are on immunosuppressive drugs um, and people who've received cancer chemotherapy um, after a certain period of time uh, seem to do fine with, with our advanced therapies. Uh, those with um, solid organ transplantation should probably be managed at a, a tertiary center um, in the same setting as where their uh, organ transplant took place. Next. So obviously when we choose therapies, we wanna make it as convenient as possible for the patient. Um, 
uh, anti-TNFs come in, in two varieties, the uh, intravenous uh, type, which is uh, infliximab, and the adalimumab is uh, self-injected. Um, as uh, same with uh, ustekinumab and rizikinumab. Um, those first start off at I, as an IV infusion and then are given subcutaneously by the patient at home or if they choose to can come to the office for the uh, nurse practitioner to uh, inject them. Um, the small molecules are oral medications um, such as the JAK inhibitors um, and uh, the S1Ps. Uh, there are actually um, studies now for um, vetalizumab uh, which is given as an intravenous infusion to likely be approved for subcutaneous use, use at home, uh, probably in the first or second quarter of next year. Um, and there will be oral IL-23s coming down the road as well, but that's probably several years away. Uh, next. So I mentioned heart failure, blood clots, again, JAK inhibitors, and understanding also that <clears throat> inflammatory bowel disease, especially in uh, ulcerative colitis, for example, um, <clears throat> is um, uh, a hypercoagulable state. So we have to be mindful of that. And sometimes, well, any patient with IBD who's hospitalized should likely be on a prophylactic uh, anticoagulation. Uh, while they're in the hospital and at bed rest. Um, and that goes doubly for patients with ulcer ulcerative colitis. And we used to always scratch our heads and say, my God, these people are having bleeding. We're going to anticoagulate them. But the idea is to prevent them get, from getting major emboli like pulmonary emboli or cerebral emboli and having strokes. So um, again, some of the drugs are used for both rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis, and we can likely get uh, double use for the same medication in patients who have both diseases. Um, obviously, we'd like to give patients oral drugs if they have needle phobia, but sometimes needles can't be avoided if that's the therapy that they need, and we have to kind of get them through it. Um, next. I mentioned these earlier, the uh, uh, extra-intestinal manifestations, but I want to focus on um, pyoderma gangrenosum, which is a horrible dermatologic complication, most commonly of ulcerative colitis, but can be seen in Crohn's as well. There's something called erythema nodosum, which are usually present as red blotches on shins that are painful, and those are, are treated by uh, usually increasing the, the underlying uh, therapy of the IBD. Um, uveitis is an eye inflammation that's important to treat immediately because it, it can lead to uh, chronic issues with vision. Perianal Crohn's disease, I don't really look at as an extra intestinal manifestation, but more of concomitant uh, with Crohn's uh, colitis usually, but sometimes even with ileitis. Um, and that's sometimes a very difficult to treat problem, um, though there are strides being made. When someone has perianal Crohn's disease, it's very important to get a colorectal surgeon on board because sometimes it's related to abscess formation. The abscess needs to be drained and something called a seton inserted, which is a little nylon string that goes through the opening of the tract that's going from inside the rectum out to the perianal area and causing uh, the, the abscess to occur. Um, next slide. And then remember that list in terms of choosing medications, insurance access is, like it says, an unfortunate reality of our healthcare system. Um, the amount of time the physician and his staff or her staff spend on the phone arguing with insurance companies to the point where it's almost as if it's a game and the insurance companies are you know, trying to deny, deny, deny. Um, and they figure by a certain point, you'll just give up and, and not pursue 
the change of therapy that you want or um, even allow for any advanced therapies. One of my partners recently had an incident with one of the insurance companies where she was trying to get approval for one of the JAK inhibitors for her patient. I think it was a JAK inhibitor or it was an IL-23. I don't remember which, but the insurance company proposed putting the patient on a therapy that we have not used in years. Um, and it was absurd, but finally, when she did a peer-to-peer, -peer, they approved the drug she asked for. But it, it just points out the ridiculousness of the insurance companies. They're not your friends, clearly. Um, and their bottom line is their bottom line. And that's all they're trying to enhance. They're not trying to enhance the well-being of the patient by making them crazy trying to get approvals. Um, so we try to work as best as possible. And the Crohn's Colitis Foundation has helped us tremendously. They have a series of letters that they've helped with and, and their advocacy programs have certainly helped. And usually if I say to the peer review person that I speak to, I'm gonna to have to call the insurance uh, commissioner. They usually um, are very much more favorable when changing their minds. Um, so we just have to be aggressive. Um, and as I heard at, at the meeting, uh, occasionally tell white lies even to get approvals, but we're trying to benefit the patient, not keep them from getting better. And in the long run, the insurance companies should face the fact that these therapies save them a huge amount of money going forward. One hospitalization can, say, can pay for more than a year's therapy with these agents. So it's fool, foolish behavior on their part and truly penny wise pound foolish on their parts. Um, so in summary, the goals of treatment um, and we need to be more interactive with patients and their families. Um, and I try to emphasize that when I take care of patients that, that the patients are part of the decision-making process. I, can, I present the options as I think would be appropriate for them, but they have to decide to um, take part in this decision-making process. And most important for patients is adherence to therapy and compliance with follow-up visits. That's one of the biggest problems we have. When patients start to feel well, they go into a, 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 a pattern of, of behavior where they don't wanna know their, they have a disease that's a chronic disease and they don't show up for follow-up visits. Some of them skip um, infusion visits, which then leads to you know, a flare up of their disease and they call desperately in need of an infusion and we have no place to put them um, acutely and then they have to go to the hospital. It becomes a whole mess. So it's a, it's a two-way system, both for us and for the patient, but adherence to therapy goals, adherence to getting tests done on an inappropriate time are very important for leading to long-term success um, with these illnesses. Um, Decision-making both on our part in, in the pediatric population, which we don't take care of, but with the pa pediatric patient's family, making it easier for everybody to, to take care of them, to take care of both the patient and, and us to be helpful with their care depends a lot on, on the patient's attitude of being uh, positive about it. Um, we're, we're out to make patients satisfied with their therapy and, and have successful therapies going forward where both of us are very big, have very big smiles at the end of the day. One of the most gratifying things about taking care of patients with IBD is seeing them feeling better and leading normal lives. And over the years, I've had a lot more successes than failures. And going forward, I plan to have a lot more successes considering the therapeutic options that are available. Uh, I'm gonna answer questions for you if I can within the time remaining. Dr. Heller, thank you so much. That was a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, thank you. So I, 
Let me see if I see any here in the queue. And I'm not Beth Javik. As uh, yes. the <laughs> so but we it, have a couple of questions here. Um, how would you treat a senior who has had this disease over 40 plus years differently? What do they need to watch out for? Well, first of all, it depends on what disease they have, how extensive their involvement is, what medications they're on, and what are their concomitant um, medical problems. So if you tell me you have someone who's had the disease for 40 years and they started in you know, their 30s, so they're now in their 70s, and they've been on a stay, for example, they've had mild ulcerative colitis and they've been stable on the salamine therapies, um, that, um, that they should not um, have any issues with continued taking of the medication because the medication is, can prevent, can prevent flare-ups of disease and is, they should have their colonoscopies done to make sure that they don't have any changes that suggest a, a, a step toward getting cancer, um, even though they feel well and have had no problems. I always remember, uh, well, he was young at the time, but it was a patient of Dan Presence when I was a resident who had a severe ulcerative colitis attack requiring hospitalization, steroids almost required surgery, but was salvaged with steroids and did fine and never showed up again for another visit to Dr. Present until he needed a document signed when he was getting married at that time, I guess it was VD testing done. Um, and Dr. President said, I'll only agree to sign it. And this was 10 years later, if you have a barium enema and it was in the pre-colonoscopy period, the guy had a colon cancer. Um, so, you know, again, if he had been followed, that would have gone, would not have gone to the same extent. So patients need to, to, you know, be adherent to both their medications and follow up. And if they're doing well on the medications that they're on and they've had no side effects, then that's fine. But uh, on the other hand, you get, you know, a 65 year old person who's had severe Crohn's disease that has not gotten better over a period of time on a, a, a change initially from uh, TNF inhibitors and immunomodulator therapy because over time, TNF agents, um, if they were used alone, patients develop antibodies because they're biologics. Um, and um, what's interesting is over the past several years, there's even a genetic marker that is predictive of a higher likelihood of getting antibody formation and therefore making the use of immunomodulators even more important in those patients. And immunomodulators are either a 6-MP or Imuran or methotrexate. Um, and that's basically aimed at keeping the antibody levels down so that the levels of the, of the drug it can be more effective. Uh, you get a higher level of drug in, in, in the tissues and, and that leads to uh, better outcomes. But let's say there's a patient who's having all sorts of issues um, and not responding to therapy, then you have to make switches. But you have to obviously take into consideration their, their comorbid conditions. Someone with bad cardiac disease um, is not going to be continued on a TNF, um, and they'll be put on an IL-23 in all likelihood, um, or IL-1223. Um, if they had colitis, they wouldn't be put on a JAK inhibitor if they had severe cardiovascular disease because of the risks involved in that case. So the important thing that I can emphasize is each patient is their own individual. Crohn's disease especially has its own brain. It does what it wants to do when it wants to do it. And with ulcerative colitis, uh, it, it's oftentimes a little bit easier um, than treating complicated Crohn's disease because the complications are usually limited to the lining to the mucosa, unless God forbid a cancer occurs. Um, but obviously in the severe acute ulcerative colitis cases that require hospitalization and are absolutely near surgery, then you know 
a perforation could cause a lot of complications too. Um, but in general, in the Crohn's uh, patient, we have to deal more with changes of therapy and things like that. Um, but no si one size fits all. That's the bottom line is individualized therapy um, and lots of support. Um, I just mentioned to Lisa earlier today that at the meeting, I was just that I learned of a, a group called Trellis Health, which is actually based in White Plains, um, that was developed by um, uh, two, two people, Lori Kiefer at the University of Pittsburgh, who's a psychologist, um, and the head of pe pediatric. Uh, Dr. Dubinsky. Yeah, Marla Dubinsky, who actually was just awarded with a Sherman Prize um, at, at this meeting. And Marla and Laura, Lori recognize the need for patients to have support systems, both nutritional and psychological support. And I, I, um, I found this to be very interesting. It's an online site called Trellis Health, T-R-E-L-L-U-S uh, health.com. And, you know, I, I can tell you that it looks very promising as another adjunct to help you get through a lot of issues, whether it's dietary concerns, uh, stress, anxiety, um, things like that, which play an important role. Uh, the gut brain GI interactions are so important, not only in, in IBD, but in so many other GI disorders that we take care of. And uh, this site looks like it's really gonna be a winner. Um, so I encourage you to at least check it out. Um, there's, I, I think they've gotten a grant as well recently so that maybe a first month or two might not even be charged. I'm not sure of that though. Um, well, thank you for that. We actually have one other question. Sure. Um, I'll read that to you here. It says, I am 31 and I'm concerned about the impact in Tivio and all drugs may have on my fertility. Where do I look for guidance on this and who should I consult? Well, you should consult your gastroenterologist who's prescribing your Intivio. Intivio should really not have any of the beauty of Intivio is it's locally acting in the gut pretty much only. It doesn't uh, affect other organs. It doesn't have systemic side effects really. Um, it, 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 it works on the lining and it, it's an anti-integrin. Um, so integrin is <clears throat> a cytokine that helps with lymphocyte trafficking uh, from the blood into the intestine uh, lining. Um, so Antivio is a perfect drug in terms of, uh, you know, not having a problem with fertility. Um, and most of the other drugs are uh, fairly, uh, the ones that, uh, again, looking back historically, sulfasalazine and the mesalamines in general, but more the sulfasalazine, lowers sperm count in men. Um, so that would often be a problem in not even if the man is, you know, if the woman is not getting pregnant and it's because her husband who's taking sulfasalazine has a low sperm count, having nothing to do with, with uh, the, the, the uh, female in, in, this, in this pair. So you know, that's something to consider. Some drugs can uh, cause fertility issues uh, for men, but um, Intivio uh, or Vitalizumab is, is not a problem. But that should be discussed with your practitioner. And I encourage everybody to ask questions, write your questions down before you go for your visits, because you always forget that question when you're in the stress of a visit. You always, oh, there's one more question I forgot to ask. So. That's great advice. And I will say Crohn's and Clitus Foundation on the website does have some co-decision-making materials and question guides that you can use with your practitioners to Dr. Heller's point, just to kind of jog your memory before your visits about the things that you may want to discuss. I just want to encourage everybody here who is not a member yet of the Crohn's Colitis Foundation to make sure you become members and support this organization, mm -hmm. which does amazing work. And as Lisa said, was 
vital in supporting some of the research that has brought these new medications uh, to use. It, it is an incredible organization. Um, and there's so much rich, rich available material online from the foundation office. And I always tell people, make sure you're not putting .com on anything where, you inter where you're interested in getting medical information that's gonna be helpful for you um, in terms of basic understanding of things. Most of the .com things are selling things. That's why they're .coms, they're commercials. Thank you, Dr. Heller. And we just received a nice comment. Um, our guest says she just wants to tell Dr. Heller that this was very informative. I loved that when he spoke about Dr. Present, he was my doctor and I was part of his trials. That's great to hear. And I hope you're well. Uh, Lisa, I did want to ask Dr. Heller one last question. I know we're going to wrap up soon. Uh, Dr. Heller, you mentioned that you're 75 uh, mm -hmm. years old. And I was wondering, do you think in your lifetime we will see a cure for IBD? Uh, in my lifetime, I'm not uh, hedging that bet because I don't know. I appreciate every day I get. Um, and uh, I, I honestly don't know whether we will or not. I think we're a ways off. But I think that what's happening now is, and, and going back to one of Lisa's first slides, where um, causes of IBD, and on the bottom, there was the microbiome. Five years ago, that was not on there. Five years ago was genetics, immunology, and environment, or a diet and environment. So the microbiome is, is, is now a new confounder. And we have to understand the interactions because a lot of, there's a lot of um, information to try and digest about the microbiome. Um, we see patterns of uh, different families of bacteria. And now we know viruses are important and fungi are important and, and other microorganisms that people don't need to know the names mm -hmm. of. But it's not one specific bug, for example, uh, at one point, there was a, a, a big push toward thinking that um, Crohn's disease was caused by an atypical mycobacterium. Mycobacterium uh, is a kind of bacteria that causes tuberculosis because it's a granulomatous inf inflammation oftentimes. And when it was first described by Dr. Crohn in 1932, um, tuberculosis of the intestine was pretty common. And this was non-caseating granulomatous ileitis that was reported. And actually, um, Crohn is credited with it because he's the first name on the paper, but it was Crohn, Ginsberg, and Oppenheimer. And Ginsberg was the surgeon and Oppenheimer was the uh, pathologist. And they should have gotten as much credit as Crohn for the disease. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Crohn when he was 99 years old. He preceded Dr. Janowitz, who was the head of GI when I trained at Sinai, but Dr. Crone was, was there before him. <laughs> he was this cute little man. <laughs> well, and Dr. Kornbluth, Dr. Kornbluth um, who's one of the uh, prominent uh, IBD specialists in the city, has Dr. Crone's desk. Wow. In his yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Heller. That was really informative. It doesn't look like we have any other questions here. Um, so once again, I'll just thank you profusely for your time and your knowledge today. It's and it's really my pleasure, and I'm happy to do this. Thank I you, enjoy and thank this. you too. And I'm happy for Zoom. <laughs> and thank you to our friends at Montefiore Nyack for hosting this thank, as well. And thank I'll talk you as to well you. to Montefiore, my friends there. Thank you, and thanks Montefiore for. Nyack. Thanks to all our attendees. Uh, until the yeah. next community chat, have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.